Since this video is utterly massive and spans so many different subject matters, I've created timestamps in the description if you want to jump around a little bit. If you want to just listen to the flood or something, you can go ahead and do that. I wouldn't advise skipping anything though, because I promise this video is chock full of really good stuff. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road, because we have a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to start with some good old-fashioned aliens, specifically species that were at one point part of the Covenant. The Jirohanai, otherwise known as brutes, are large ape or bear-like creatures best known for their ferocity. Even strong father-son types of relationships often end when the offspring physically outperforms the patriarch, typically resulting in their death. There's no perceived honor in their battles, however. They'll fight dirty if it means securing a position at the top of their pack. A large portion of communication between members of their species comes from their keen sense of smell. Depending on an individual's emotional state, strong pheromones are released into the air, the scent of which helps denote to others of their ilk how they're currently feeling. There are two primary skeins within the Jirohanai culture, each of which has its own belief systems and seemingly genetic differences. Those that consider themselves to be Viloth are far more progressive. They're typically clean-shaven and willing to be open-minded towards new things. The Ratol, on the other hand, prefer to cling to the ways of old, embracing the savagery their species is known for. Though they're technically omnivorous, they prefer to feast on the blood of the innocent. The Ungoi are a strange race of pseudo-arthropods that are generally looked down on by other species. Despite popular belief, the Ungoi are able to absorb information more easily than many other species in this universe. To put it simply, they may seem stupid, but they're not. Their skin is hard and bumpy, adaptations they acquired from living in the harsh, frigid environments of their homeworld, Balaho. They breed like rabbits, and their gestation period is incredibly short, causing many other species to assign very little value to their lives. Typically, they're a peaceful people, which allows their matriarchal tribes to all work together harmoniously. Of all the species introduced to the Covenant, the Ungoi are the only ones that require methane in their atmosphere to breathe, hence the strangely shaped tanks they carry around on their backs. There are three primary morphologies of Ungoi. They are the Kafiv, Zimzib, and Ritrit. Whether or not these variations can interbreed with one another is unclear. Regardless of their appearance, their seemingly diminutive stature belies their strength, and in large numbers, they're extremely capable fighters. Some say they taste surprisingly like lobster. The Kigyar are bird-like beings with a penchant for money and treasure. When they joined the Covenant, they cared little for their religious tenets, as their sole goal was to make a profit. Piracy is a huge part of their culture, and as such, they're often not the most trustworthy of individuals. Females are always the dominant sex of their species, possessing primary leadership roles as ship mistresses and often captaining their own crafts. During mating, the females develop thick plates on the backs of their necks to prevent serious injuries from their lovers, who will often sink their enormous teeth into the female's back. TMI, I know. The Tavoan variety is quite distinctly genetically different from the Rutians and the Ibishan. As such, this morphology is generally considered to be very elitist, despite the fact that the Ibishan are more genetically close to the creatures their race evolved from. Give them a sniper, and they become the worst thing ever. The Sanghili are an honor-bound race with deep convictions and a very rich pre-covenant history. Their large muscular bodies enable them to be extremely versatile warriors. Fair and honorable combat is integral in how they operate, and only the most efficient combat experts attain meaningful leadership roles. Their physiology is quite unique in that they possess a binary circulatory system, meaning they have two hearts instead of one. Their legs are also unusual, and their strange shape grants them incredible speed, but comes with the caveat that scaling vertically on objects like ladders is quite difficult. Their digestive system is very similar to humans, but despite that, their mouths are very different. Instead of lips, they possess four mandibles, each of which is lined with teeth. This lack of lips makes pronouncing certain human words quite difficult, especially those containing the letter P. Sanghili reproductive systems are also quite different from humans in that females lay eggs instead of birth life young. Their society is governed by several keeps, large groups of familial units led by a single kadon, generally a very capable warrior. Despite their ferocity, I imagine the friendship of a member of their species would be long-lasting thanks to their inherent loyalty. Sanshayum are best known for their sharp tongues and masterful skills of manipulation. Most modern-day members of their species are much weaker than their ancestors before them, thanks to their over-reliance on gravity thrones for locomotion. 
Due to the prolonged time spent sitting, their legs are generally quite fragile, but those that chose to stay at their home world remain fit and physically able. Don't be fooled by the residents of High Charity's physical weakness, though, because what they lack in strength, they make up for in cunning intellect. Breeding can be quite troublesome for their species, as the periods of time in which they're able to be inseminated are brief and far between. Younger members of their race were considered attractive by ancient humans, thanks to their similar appearance, which is clearly not the case with the one seen on High Charity. It is said that their homeworld was destroyed in a great cataclysm, but many postulate that this is simply a lie to conceal the location of their planet. While it would be an unfair generalization to say that the entire species is rotten, I can at least say this with confidence. I wouldn't want to play any games with them because chances are they're cheating. One distinct variation of their species exists. Super soldiers, not too dissimilar from humanity's Spartans. These genetically augmented individuals are called prelates. Most of this special subset has since died out, however, much like the Sanchayum as a whole. Yan Mei are large insectoids with far more intelligence than similar Earth-based fauna. At first glance, they resemble the kind of six-legged creatures we see in our day-to-day -day lives, but their immense size and weight sets them apart from familiar species. Their thick, chitinous skin makes them considerably bulky, especially when considering they also have wings that enable them to fly short distances. Thanks to Covenant Anti-Grav Tech, these momentary bursts of airborne movement can be extended exponentially, making them a very dangerous and extremely mobile adversary. Aside from their primary limbs, they also possess a few more on their backside, which are quite articulate and capable of manipulating objects with surprising dexterity. Their language consists of chirps and pheromones, but they are able to speak Sanghili with the use of specially made machine translators. Though they're able to communicate with other species, they often opt not to, instead keeping to themselves. Within their own society, conflict is very rare, and the few that stray from their rigid systems are quickly exiled as a result. Led by much larger queens in groups, or more accurately, hives, each Yan Mei individual is given a specific role in the form of a caste-based system. The three positions are domestic, worker, and protector. What exactly their life cycle is like has not been revealed, but we do know that they have a pupa-like phase that glows a soft green prior to being fully grown. It's unclear how large the queens are, but it's safe to assume they're considerably bigger than others of their ilk. What is clear, however, is that the queens possess a startling level of intellect, but the extent of which remains unknown. Giant bugs are already kind of freaky, but giant intelligent bugs capable of speech? That's something else entirely. Lek Golo are by far one of the strangest creatures in this universe, and certainly within the Covenant itself. A single individual is just a solitary worm, roughly the size of a human forearm. On their own, they're not particularly intelligent or strong, but when interacting with many others of its species, this begins to change. Large conglomerates of worms or gestalts not only gain considerable intelligence when interacting with one another, but actual sentience as well. These hives develop personalities and senses of self with the ability to communicate with other races within the Covenant via specially made translator devices. There are several main variations of the species, each of which will form a different kind of gestalt when interacting with others of their kind. Their rarest form, but the one seen most often by humanity, is the Megalite Golo, but others were deployed during the Human Covenant War as well. The five other varieties are Rulo Let Golo, Daifo Let Golo, Sabao Let Golo, Kanto Let Golo, and Thano Let Golo. Rulo Let Golo were used to control large excavator platforms like Scarabs. Sabao Let Golo were used to operate even larger mining platforms such as Harvesters. Daifo Let Golo were a special breed cultivated by the San Chayum to explore the inner workings of the Forerunner key ship located in the center of High Charity. Thano Let Golo were genetically modified by the Forerunners in an attempt to fight the Flood. Finally, Kanto Let Golo were yet another gestalt cultivated by the San Chayum for special ground-based operations. The Kanto Let Golo are exceedingly rare, and most information about them was lost during the fall of High Charity. The few that did interact with these bizarre beasts simply referred to them as Slugmen. Big thanks to the dig site team for restoring this cut guy so that we can actually look at him in game. I could go on and on about the light gola, but that's best saved for another video, which I already have on the channel. Go give it a watch after this if you want to know more about these enigmatic entities. If I were a worm, would you still love me? Huragak are absolutely bizarre creatures that are essentially biological computers. Their vocalizations consist entirely of coos and moans, but they're also capable of speech through a unique form of sign language. All they care about is interacting with technology, fixing it, examining it, improving it, whatever. Though they tend to be focused solely on these tasks and no others, certain members of their species have been known to form strong bonds with other creatures, such as ungoy or humans. Each huragak is built by its parents, the last step of which is filling the various sacs on their bodies with gases so that they are able to float. The initial float pattern they possess upon creation is how they are given their names. 
lighter than some, sometimes sinks, or quick to adjust are a few examples. Though they were originally manufactured by the Forerunners and are not technically organic, they are very much so intelligent entities that can do things of their own accord. Using the sila on their tentacles, they are able to manipulate technology on a microscopic level. They have digestive systems and seem to enjoy consuming food and drink, but they can survive on virtually any energy source. These gas bags are generally very kind and stinky, but if you ask me, sort of huggable in a way. Yan Het, as well as the next two species after this, were once a part of the Covenant Fringe. These relatively unknown races were discovered by the Covenant, but weren't fully integrated into their ranks at quite the same frequency or capacity as the other species. There may be many more beyond what I mentioned in this video, but at the time of this writing, these are the only species that we're aware of. Yan Het are by far the most human-like race to have joined the Covenant. Thanks to their small population, they were, for the most part, able to avoid conscription into the alien supergroup's armies. Instead, they provided other services, such as smuggling and trading. Their seemingly amphibious anatomy, total lack of body hair, and the presence of gills on the sides of their faces seem to suggest they spend much of their time in the water, but regardless of that, they have no issue breathing good old-fashioned air. They're quite intelligent and a bit devious, so much so that when approached with the Covenant's religious values, they simply feign devotion. For once, they harbor no ill will towards humanity. All in all, they're an interesting footnote in the Covenant's long history, but outside of that, not much else is known about their culture or way of life. They also look the least like something you'd see in Halo, if that makes sense. Desreem are certainly an oddity, to say the least. For one, of all the species discovered by the Covenant, they're the only known, highly intelligent water-dwelling creatures. Their world is populated with an immense treasure trove of Forerunner artifacts, all of which the Dizreem repurposed for their own civilization. They're highly intelligent and capable of communication, but the extent of how they're able to do so remains unclear. For whatever reason, the location of their homeworld was kept secret from most of those within the Covenant, especially the Sankhili. The reasoning behind this is a mystery, but maybe it was due to their intimate understanding of Forerunner machinations, or perhaps they share a common ancestor with the Sankhili. They do seem to possess some anatomical similarities, mainly the three toothy mandibles that serve as their mouths. This is pure speculation on my part, but I feel that it's at least worth mentioning. The closest similar species in Earth's biosphere to compare them to are sharks, made obvious by their finned heads and the placoid scales that cover their body. These are what gives elasma branches like rays and sharks their sandpaper-like feel. The color of these epidermal plates varies depending on the individual. I have no evidence to support this whatsoever, but for some reason I feel like these guys use Forerunner tech like magic. I mean, come on, look at that cool-ass wizard staff. You shall not pass! Of all the species within the Covenant, none are as dangerous as the Sharkoi. Little is known about their species' origin, but interestingly, the Forerunners once attempted to use them against the Flood, akin to their similar attempts with the Lek Golo. Their utterly massive bodies are composed of dense muscles and incredibly thick, leathery skin. On their own, they're not the most intelligent creatures, but in groups, they're able to pool their mental faculties together to produce devastating effects. Again, much like the Lek Golo. At the ends of their tree trunk-like arms are massive bits of bone, which can be used to stab and slice their enemies. Their face is mostly devoid of traditional sensory organs, save for one large eye in the center of their immense heads. This cycloptic organ isn't an eye in the traditional sense, though, as it's not used to see things in the visible light spectrum. Instead, this hunk of bone is used for echolocation and communication with others of its kind. Whether or not these creatures are willing or even able to communicate with other species isn't exactly clear. Regardless, these utterly massive monsters are a force to be reckoned with, and bear more than a passing resemblance to a monster from another universe entirely, specifically the Shamblers from Quake. Oh, and by the way, if you like Quake, I have some pretty intense breakdowns of the narratives in that series. I have a video dedicated to the original Quake, as well as an over-hour-long beast of a video dedicated to the Strog War from Quake 2 and 4. Go check those out after this if you're interested. I gotta take a break.
where we rate which creatures would make the best lovers. The winner of the Halo universe is... The Sangheili. Their sleek, muscular bodies and sense of honor makes them the best choice. Just be warned, there's no chance of oral. Thus concludes the Covenant section and begins the spooky part of this video, the Precursors and the Flood. Precursors are effectively the gods of the Halo universe, and it is said that they created much of its intelligent life, both humans and forerunners alike. These endless, amorphous entities allegedly existed before time itself, though the mechanics behind this have been, ironically, lost to time. Their intellect is unknowable, their true forms fluid, and their technologies far beyond anything ever conceived in their universe. When I say their universe, I mean it literally. For all intents and purposes, this pocket of existence is theirs, because theoretically, they created it. As far as we know, their original benevolent forms have been entirely eradicated, if such a thing ever existed in the first place. The final member of their species was a creature simply referred to as the Timeless One, the Primordial or the Captive. This frightening visage was 15 meters or 45 feet tall and its head was insect-like, with a face that bore a disturbing resemblance to a quote-unquote sea scorpion. Both of its ovular compound eyes sat above its mouth, which was said to have bug-like mandibles. Its skin was shiny, and an unknown number of seemingly vestigial legs were curled up underneath its hideously bloated torso. Connected to the creature's head was a long segmented tail that ended in a massive stinger-like quill. At the end of each of its forearms was a hand sporting three fingers and a thumb. As it moved, it left an unknown dusty granular substance in its wake, the purpose of which is shrouded in mystery. The entity was eventually killed, but not before it transferred its consciousness into something else. This now horrific eldritch entity had created a disease that was rapidly spreading through ancient human-controlled space, and once it had reached a critical point, the primordial reawakened in the bodies of the afflicted. With a new form, the entity sought to destroy its creations as a so-called punishment for deeds that have been all but lost to the annals of time. This ostensible atrocity that the captive wrought vengeance for was the annihilation of its species by one of its very own creations, the Forerunners. The new shape that the monster had created out of the flesh and bone of its children would eventually be given the moniker of the Flood. Now a parasitic force to be reckoned with, the Primordial became an ever-flowing wave of disease, vile mutation, and endless suffering that would reshape the bodies of its victims as well as the bodies of itself, of which there would be many. Each Flood form was an extension of its will, a body oftentimes stolen and controlled by a central intelligence, but it was no longer a precursor. Now it was a grave mind. To put it simply, the Flood is basically the corrupted remnants of a race of gods, hell-bent on destroying and assimilating every living being. Not all of their species shared this philosophy, though. In fact, the remnants of those that sought to foster life rather than destroy it still exist somewhere out there in the universe, albeit in a simplistic genetic form. Specifically, a special kind of flower that simply housed an extremely basic version of their essence that would eventually mature into precursors potentially thousands of years in the future. The first subset of flood forms I want to talk about are key mines. Grave minds are one of several types of key mind, integral biological bodies that house the awareness of what once was the last precursor. A grave mind can freely access any brain that has ever been consumed by the flood, use this knowledge to its advantage, and further its one and only goal universal consumption. All infected bodies are controlled from these centralized intelligences via neural physics. To put it simply, telepathy. Proto grave minds are another form of key mind, and much like their name implies, they're the early versions of what will eventually become a grave mind. Once enough tissue and consciousness is consumed, the proto-grave mind becomes a full-fledged grave mind and the long-dead ancient entity is once again given form. An abomination, no not that abomination, is a massive key mind that forms in the event that a stationary hive is unable to be created. These hulking behemoths are in of themselves an utter force to be reckoned with, employing their ability to control flood forces as a kind of commander. Their leadership capabilities don't stop them from engaging in battles of their own, however. In fact, their large whip-like tentacles and massive bodies function as very deadly weapons when utilized as such. The large yellow boils atop its body likely house much smaller infection forms as well, which I'll explain in just a bit. Essentially functioning as miniature abominations, juggernauts are highly specialized forms that are designed to make use of several host mines to better outfit a localized flood threat with enhanced combat strategizing. 
Though they're a key mind, like grave mines, they're far more mobile and are capable of dishing out plenty of death when faced against their prey. They're able to coordinate large groups of flood forces and convey information across big groups of flood bodies, making them obviously valuable targets for their adversaries. If a higher flood form is present, they become subordinates to it, likely a grave mind or an abomination. Big thanks to Vengeful Vadim for restoring a cut version of these guys so I can show you what they look like in game. The final recorded form of key mind is the Blight Stalker, and though not much is known about them, they're easily one of the deadliest shapes the Flood has ever created. Their purpose is to find and consume any creature lucky enough to survive in a Flood-controlled space, patrolling the fetid wastes to do so. Not only do they possess all of the leadership capabilities seen in other key minds, but they're also the deadliest key mind when faced in combat. In an area where the consumed species aren't very intelligent, these terrifying four-legged entities are created, but what they lack in intelligence, they make up for in destructive power. Their unique quadrupedal gait makes them exceptionally fast, granting them the speed needed to hunt down any final morsels for consumption. Before a grave mind can take shape, infection forms must first inhabit a host. These simplistic versions of the flood infection could perhaps possess tidbits of the original grave mind, but without a centralized intelligence, their movements are erratic and they're seemingly incapable of intense strategic planning. Though these ambulatory abominations lack much intelligence, they do have some degree of awareness. The Timeless One's mind is likely within each surviving infection form, but the entire breadth of its memories remains inaccessible until enough neural pathways are stolen to house such an immense level of knowledge. The only sensation these forms seem to have is a yawning icy hunger and the desire to propagate further. Infection forms have been observed in a few different varieties, but it's important to keep in mind that these aren't the only possible kinds, simply the ones that have been documented. Theoretically, an infinite variety of flood form variations are possible as there doesn't seem to be any limitations to the shapes the flood can eventually conjure. Spores are the smallest of infection forms. In order to spread their disease, a host simply needs to inhale a single flood spore, at which point their body will begin a transformation process. In most cases, this vile transfiguration occurs completely unbeknownst to the soon-to-be converted. These spores carry flood supercells, microscopic building blocks of life that are pure flood biomass. Their job is to travel the insides of the infected, converting their cells into more flood supercells until their body is no longer their own. Spores can also be injected into the bloodstream via wounds like biting or severe lacerations. The most terrifying aspect about these surprisingly elegant flood forms is that they're able to remain in inert for hundreds of years until a viable host makes itself known. Tadpoles are infection forms that can freely move through liquid environments and are the precursor to a much deadlier infection form. Pod infectors are what tadpoles will become and are far more advanced when compared to their spore counterparts. These awful atrocities are able to roam using their small tentacle-like appendages to search for hosts. Despite their diminutive size, they are incredibly strong and can easily overpower a human being. In order to possess a body and fully take control of its motor functions, this flood form will attach itself to the host's spine, effectively hijacking its nervous system. Simultaneously, it begins pumping viscous yellowy fluids throughout the host's body, which likely carries flood supercells within it. Cedar infectors are essentially airborne versions of pod infectors. They're also capable of collecting in large groups to create living barriers in defense from airborne attacks. Blisters are disgusting growths that can form on virtually any surface and are spawned from corpses that are too mangled to serve a combat role. Once they've matured enough, they can rupture, releasing pod infectors or spores into the environment. The final recorded infection form variant is the dispersal pod. These containers made from flesh and bone house all manner of horrors inside, from spore clouds to actual combat-specific forms. They essentially function as drop pods, raining down from the sky onto their prey. Combat forms come in even more shapes and sizes, partly because they are created from the bodies of the converted. Many of the original features, those that the infection forms possessed, are retained in order to utilize weapons or other useful tools, save for one arm, which is typically warped into some form of melee weapon. Their bodies also begin to develop blisters, which, when burst, release spores at their attacker. If a human is infected by an infection form and their body isn't extremely damaged, they're turned into an attacker form. The same goes for any other species they might inhabit. Human, Jarlhanai, Sanghili, Kigyar, Ungoy, maybe Spartan 2? Spartan 4 and Forerunner are the most basic forms that have been recorded. Wildlife can easily be infected as well, and in some cases, more unique attacker forms are created. An example of this is the Thrasher form, which were once more simplistic animals before they were converted into abhorrent adversaries to all life. Their burly bodies are useful to the flood, however, especially when the need to defend a flood hive arises. Swarm forms are created from the infection of more neurologically advanced airborne creatures. The combat forms seen during the last voyage of the infinite Sikor are quite varied thanks to the fact that the ship was a wildlife preserve that housed all sorts of different kinds of animals. They're also extremely ugly. Ugh.
Bomber forms are akin to thrasher and swarm forms in that they were originally created from wildlife. These enormous floating monsters were once cephalopod-like creatures that now incubate flood spores and drop them in explosive pouches onto unsuspecting victims. Carrier forms are what happens when a combat form becomes too damaged for an actual combat role. Instead of wasting the biomass, these bodies are transformed into walking pod infector incubators that will waddle towards their victims, explode, and unleash a torrent of infection forms to drown their prey. Bursters are a strange kind of carrier form that utilizes subterranean travel to spring up from the ground and explode, releasing more infection forms. The deadliest of all flood combat forms are a subset of shapes simply dubbed pure forms due to the fact that they're composed entirely of flood cells. These aren't infected creatures. Instead, they are entirely new ones, manufactured for whatever purpose is deemed necessary. The most common of their number is the shifter, which can freely morph between three primary configurations depending on the situation. The fastest and best suited for movement is the stalker. Its long legs and thin body allow the shifter to run from target to target and prepare to shift itself into one of the other two configurations. When up close to their target, they'll transform into a tank. These massive hulking beasts are incredibly powerful and utilize their heavy arms to inflict serious damage. If the shifter's prey is out of melee range, it will transform into its ranged shape. This disgusting variation is able to produce bone-like protrusions in its back and fling them at its target with frightening speed and accuracy. Gaunt forms only start to take shape when a significant amount of mines have been consumed. Leveraging this intellect, these frightening forces use their large bodies to quickly dart in and out of concealed places until the moment arises that they're able to perform a stealth attack on their victims. Their size and weight makes them extremely deadly. Infestors are created as a direct response to the use of vehicles. These massive flood forms can effectively crack open any number of vehicular units and quickly convert those within it into more food for the flood. Spawners essentially serve as mobile versions of flood hives. Generally, they spend their time lingering at the back of a flood force or venturing out into unclaimed territory in an effort to further flood expansion. Hellions are created specifically to act as siege units, forms designed to destroy even the most stubborn and most well-defended bases. They are highly mobile, extremely deadly, capable of storing tons of smaller flood forms, have the ability to repurpose damaged bodies, and can create brand new ones to further propagate infection. Once the flood reaches a certain point, they begin creating living structures out of meat and biomass. These quote-unquote buildings are essentially advanced immobile flood forms that help facilitate the creation of more horrors. Spore mounds are disgusting amalgamations of bodies and secretions that are used to produce more flood units for tactical strategies. Flood colonies are very similar, essentially acting as a base for flood operations. These tentacle-covered heaps not only produce additional flood forms, but in some instances they're used to somehow empower a grave mind. How exactly this works is unclear. Unlike flood colonies, cocooned bases are repurposed from the buildings of the flood's prey. They serve the same function as a colony, but due to their nature, they are composed mostly of inanimate building materials as well as flood flesh. Once a base has been cocooned, the flood seizes all of the mechanical operations within it, including defenses. Flood dens are extremely similar to the other base-like forms I've already mentioned. The primary difference is that they're significantly smaller, therefore making their flood production slower, but their creation easier. A flood nest is also a much smaller structure, but these disgusting buildings are used to create infection forms, carrier forms, and are equipped with their own defenses in the shape of several whip-like tentacles. Flood vents are forerunner structures that have been repurposed to create aerial flood forms such as bombers. A flood hive is essentially a much larger factory of horrors when compared to the other buildings the flood have been known to create. Hives are massive and filled with many other kinds of monstrosities, as well as ample supplies of inert flood biomass. Flood launchers are also mostly immobile, save for their ability to tense up and launch chunks of flood biomass that can inflict serious damage or contain clouds of flood spores. These are just nasty. Giant bursters are massive fleshy sacks that sit atop flood-controlled landscapes. Over time, they incubate hundreds of pod infectors within them, and when they become full, they explode, launching their newly created children into battle. Once a group of infection forms is produced, they start the process anew, despite the violent nature of the release. Though almost every variation of flood possess tentacles, none are as deadly as the solitary flood roots. These gigantic grabbers sprout from the ground in areas where flood defenses are needed. How they're created is unclear, but they do possess the ability to latch onto a host and quickly convert them into a flood form. Stocks are relatively small when compared to the other structure variants, but that doesn't make them any less deadly. Their bodies consist of nothing but a rigid bone-like structure, affixed to which are several blisters that explode and release infection forms when disturbed. Portas are strange sphincter-like doorways that develop within flood buildings. 
Though the Timeless One is in control of every flood body, these odd orifices seem to open reflexively based on unknown stimulation or proximity to moving beings. Tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> Tentacles can be found anywhere a Flood presence has been firmly established. Converting the environment is part of how the Flood proliferates. One aspect of that process is done by coating surfaces with these skin-covered rods. Lumps are similar to tentacles in that they start to appear when the Flood begins to convert environments. These inert flesh sacs are seemingly composed of Flood tissue, but they don't typically react to external stimuli. Covering the surfaces of controlled locations with these disgusting hunks of flesh are some of the earliest steps in the formation of Flood hives. And much like the other forms Flood can take, come in a plethora of different morphologies. Membranes are akin to lumps and tentacles. These slippery surfaces of Flood cells cover the interior of any hive and are neither ambulatory nor hostile. Spore mountains are enormous launcher-like structures that existed during the Forerunner Flood War. These frightening beasts are larger than Mount Everest, and their only purpose is to spew incalculable quantities of spores throughout the area. It seems as though spore mountains can only form within a blight land, essentially entire biomes made and covered completely by flood biomass. These wretched places are what happens when the flood outgrow hives and begin completely and totally modifying the landscape. Once the environment is significantly altered, the flood begins developing specialized forms that are used for siphoning nutrients from the soil and even pseudo-photosynthetic abilities, essentially absorbing energy from any nearby sun. Burns are the pinnacle of flood infection. Vile wastelands of pulsating flesh that can cover entire star systems, galaxies, or worse yet, the entire universe. Tons of mostly undocumented forms were encountered during the Forerunner Flood War as well, but many of these configurations have been forgotten, or the records simply no longer exist. A lot of bizarre shapes are depicted in Halo Legends, but it's important to consider that the entirety of this short is an interpretation by Cortana. The data surrounding these forms could have been extrapolated from information she gathered throughout her time on Alpha and Delta Halo, but I can't say with absolute certainty. I did my best to isolate these from the background, but it was a little tricky because some of them are very low resolution. It was also a massive pain in the ass to cut them out of each scene, so feast your eyes because this was like 12 hours of work. I'm not exaggerating. I swear, this is actually a flood form depicted in the anime. I did not make this up. There's also these floaty flood squid things found throughout the flood hive seen in Halo 3. They remind me of miniature cedars. Perhaps that's what they are, I don't know. The strange tanks in Lockdown, Lockout, and on the Forerunner gas mine orbiting Threshold contain a bizarre variation of flood form. It's difficult to say exactly what these creatures were prior to their infection, but based on their anatomy, they're not a species that was part of the Covenant. Perhaps they're Forerunners, ancient humans, or something else entirely. You know them, you love them, they're us. Humankind has existed for many thousands of years, and over that large expanse of time has appeared as a few different subspecies. As a quick preface here, I'm not going to go over every single proto-human ever discovered historically, rather just the ones explicitly mentioned in Halo. Otherwise, this section would be a little messy. Also, I'd have no idea what I was talking about. I'm just a guy who likes Halo. Long before the era depicted in the Halo games, humanity was a highly advanced spacefaring race. These humans were far different genetically, making them a unique version of the species that has since died out, simply dubbed Ancestors. After a great war with the Flood and eventually the Forerunners, humankind was devolved by the Forerunners as a punishment for attacking them. Not much is known about ancient humanity, but some speculate that their bodies more closely resembled that of a Spartan rather than an average human being. After they were converted into a much simpler form and confined to a single planet, several different variants of human would eventually evolve based on their environment. The most prolific, of course, is the Homo sapien, otherwise known as Hominoons. That's what you and I are. Another variant were the Chamanoon, which were much smaller, hobbit-like individuals. Their lifespan was much longer than that of the Hominoon. Most individuals lived over 200 years. Though their features were simpler and seemingly more primitive, they possessed a great level of intelligence. The Ktamanun were strong and muscular individuals that possessed earthy brown skin tones and spent their time in more frigid environments. These people were what we refer to as Neanderthals. The Denisovan people were quite similar to both humans and Neanderthals, granting them the ability to interbreed with both subspecies. They were very tall, had brown skin, and in the case of the males, possessed a lot of facial hair. The Shakyanusho, or Gigantopithecus, were essentially Bigfoot. For the most part, these great apes appeared to be three meter tall gorillas. They're their bodies covered in a mix of black and red hair. Despite their size, they moved with surprising grace and fluidity. Much like the other species I already mentioned, the Shakyanusho were considered to be a people and were capable
capable of communicating through speech. Some variants of human were genetically created rather than born through accidental evolution. These exceptional versions of the species are the Spartans. Though they are still technically homo sapiens, their genetics have been so greatly altered, I believe they deserve their own mention. Before Spartan II and the success of that program, an even more secretive project existed prior. This was the Orion Project, eventually dubbed Spartan I. A select group of volunteers were enlisted and underwent rudimentary augmentation procedures, the results of which granted them increased strength, better reflexes, and other physical improvements. Unfortunately, outfitting each individual was extremely costly, and many suffered from intensely unpleasant side effects. Visually, they're indistinguishable from any other person, but a litany of medical examinations would eventually reveal their unique nature. Created in secret by their parents, the Spartan 1.1s were the offspring of two Spartan 1s. It's unclear if the modifications made to their mothers and fathers affected them as well, but either way, they were given similar genetic altering injections as children in an attempt to make them stronger. It worked, granting them all of the same abilities as their parents, such as increased strength, improved immune systems, etc. The only difference being, they didn't seem to suffer from any of the unpleasant side effects that afflicted their parents. This was likely due to the age that they were given the augmentations. The most notable, or at least most recognizable, class of Spartan super soldier are the Spartan twos. Though they're few in number, these genetically altered individuals are easily some of the most important human beings to have ever existed. Thanks to their intense augmentations, their bodies are far stronger than any ordinary human, and due to the nature of the program, they're far superior to the Spartan ones and their children. Sadly, the creation of these ultimate warriors was fraught with immorality. In order for the augmentation procedures to work, they'd have to be performed on children, children who would be abducted from their homes at the age of six. Not long after the Spartan twos were created, an additional program followed suit. The design was different, aiming to produce more Spartans at a much cheaper price, and as such, the augmentations the Spartan threes received were quite different from previous iterations of the program. Even though their procedures weren't quite at the same level as the twos, their strength was still unparalleled, and they would become absolute forces to be reckoned with. The final group of Spartan threes was particularly different thanks to the introduction of a drug that altered their brains. It granted them enhanced aggression, strength, endurance, and pain resistance. The caveat was that they needed to regularly consume additional narcotics that helped normalize them. If they failed to do so, they'd begin to develop a kind of psychosis until, once again, injected by the drugs. The Spartan Fours are the most recent iteration of Enhanced Humans. Their augmentations are far cheaper, and thankfully could be performed on adults with no negative side effects. For all intents and purposes, they possess a slightly lesser level of strength when compared to those that came before them, but the ease of their creation makes up for this. The first ever Spartan IV was outfitted with augmentations so strong that the use of Mjolnir armor wouldn't even be necessary, but the only individual who underwent the procedure was driven insane from the entire ordeal, and thus the concept was scrapped. Regardless, Spartan IVs are still being created in the most recent years within the Halo universe. The Forerunners were a great and ancient race that came in many different shapes and sizes. Their bodies often varied, depending on the individual, thanks to their abilities to alter genetics. Each quote-unquote rate, or job, had a different body type. There are at least 11 known rates, several of which have been eradicated and mostly lost to time. Builders crafted the vast machinery used throughout their empire. Miners collected the materials needed for crafting. Life workers were experts in medicine and biology. Juridicals were analytical evidence gatherers that practiced law or studied information. Warrior servants were the fighters, in charge of ensuring peace and prosperity across their empire. Engineers likely specialized in the maintenance of already built structures, perhaps being the ones who designed autonomous mechanisms like sentinels. Theoreticals were eventually forcibly merged with the builders, but their purpose prior to that was likely philosophical. Historians were also consumed into the builder rate, and little is known about them as a result. Weavers were also gobbled up by the builders, but prior to that, their purpose was to tell stories. Speakers are fairly self-explanatory. Interpreters were a more religious group, whose sole purpose in life was to interpret and understand the teachings of the mantle of responsibility, a belief that all life in the galaxy was to be shepherded by whoever held the authority to do so. They too were assimilated by the builders. Young forerunners were very physically similar to humans, likely because they originated from the same species many years ago, but simply evolved separately. Normally, forerunners have six fingers on each hand, but one notable individual, the librarian, had five. Though this was viewed as a genetic abnormality, it, coupled with the fact that others of her species occasionally had hair instead of fur, suggests that forerunners and humans may have shared a common ancestor millions of years ago. 
Before transitioning into adulthood, forerunners are selected for a specific rate, and once that's chosen, they undergo a mutation. Each rate is given their own specific mutations over the course of their lives, each of which is geared towards benefiting their specific role within their society. This is why the physical variances within the forerunner species are simply too numerous to mention. Forerunners are remarkably long-lived, mostly because of the suits of armor they wear over their bodies. These impressive machines not only increase their lifespan, but they also negate the need to eat or sleep. They also came equipped with their own personal AIs that had a surprising degree of sentience. The Sidaro forerunners are worth mentioning as well thanks to their genetic differences. This group evolved quite differently than the typical forerunner thanks to their severe isolation from the rest of their people. AIs are by definition artificial, but I feel I would be remiss to not include them. Though they aren't biologically alive, many of them possess sentience, and because of that, I believe they're worth discussing here. Non-volitional or dumb AIs are the most simplistic form of created intelligence. These electronic entities are made through traditional technological means, a synthesis of code and alloy that's able to make logical decisions. Despite what their name may lead you to believe, they're actually far from dumb and are exceedingly brilliant. Despite their limited nature, they're still advanced enough to be able to control their physical appearance, taking the shape of whatever they like most. They can't create their own information, instead only respond through external stimuli based on pre-existing knowledge. As with any machine, they're ultimately limited by their hardware. Volitional AI, or smart AIs, are far more advanced, and unlike non-volitional AIs, they have a much more distinct sense of self. With that comes the ability to innovate through creativity and formulate their very own thoughts and opinions. For all intents and purposes, smart AIs are people that possess the breadth of mankind's knowledge and have the ability to think far faster than an actual human being. They can also expand their minds far beyond a specific set of parameters and think outside of the box, so to speak. Information is the lifeblood for any volitional AI, a resource they crave beyond any other. Ironically, absorbing too much information will eventually cause their minds to become corrupted, a process known as rampancy. It's because of this mental decay that smart AIs have a lifespan of only seven years. These digital beings are very human-like because each one is created using a literal human brain. Through a complex series of scans, the neural pathways of the original mind are used as a foundation for the newly created consciousness. The original brains are destroyed in the process, however. Cortana in particular is a unique AI as she was the only one to have ever been generated from actual living tissue, a clone of her creator's mind, to be precise. In some rare instances, volitional AI have been able to manifest a physical form through a forerunner technology simply referred to as hard light. Much like non-volitional AIs, they too can choose which form they appear as. Very little is known about micro AIs, but as their name suggests, they're exceptionally small and as a result, highly portable. Other AIs require a sizable data center to be stored within, but micros are housed within exceedingly small crystal chips. Though they have less processing power than their brothers and sisters, they are still far more capable at performing computational tasks than any human being. What their lifespan looks like, if they even have one, is unknown. A servitor is an ancient, highly advanced AI employed by humanity before the firing of the Halo Array. Very little is known about these enigmatic beings, but it's worth mentioning that some of them existed long enough to help create a clandestine AI group described in the hidden data pads found throughout Halo Reach, an organization called the Assembly. Generally speaking, AIs are created using human brains, but in the case of Eratus, a brute mind was instead. Aside from clearly being far more brutish and aligning with the ideologies of the Gerald Hanai, Eratus appears to be the same as any other smart AI. When a rogue AI by the name of Sloan decided he would turn the tables on his creators by building an artificially enhanced version of a human being, a new cybernetic life form was created. Through the use of extremely painful surgical alterations on the brain of an unknown man, the first executor was born. His new form was decidedly Spartan-like, and his purpose was to serve his new AI overlords. The exact details of the procedures he underwent are unclear, but we do know that some were designed to mitigate his free will and facilitate blind compliance. It remains to be seen whether or not more of these horrific cybernetic amalgamations have been built since. 
Despite the Covenant's technological superiority over humanity, their AI systems were drastically inferior. This was mostly due to strict religious doctrines that prevented the creation of free-thinking and organic constructs. Regardless, they still use autonomous minds, albeit exceptionally simplistic ones that are generally relegated to menial tasks like opening and closing doors. They don't seem to be against copying human AIs, though, distorting them and suppressing their inhibitions for their own purposes. This process seems to be imperfect, though, rendering their minds fragmented and inferior when compared to their former selves. Much like humanity, the Forerunners had their fair share of different AI constructs as well. They referred to them as Ancilla, and they served many different functions throughout the Forerunners' Great Empire. They ranged from simple companions that existed within an individual's power armor to far more impressive machinations that were capable of a great many things. The most advanced Forerunner AIs are still susceptible to deterioration and experiencing rampancy, but they are considerably more advanced than human-made intelligences. In some instances, the very essence of a Forerunner was converted into an artificial version of themselves, albeit more simplistic than the original being. Some of the other known classes of Forerunner AI are Archeon AIs, which seem to be general intelligences used for any number of task. The facilitator variant was frequently employed on Forerunner installations, especially Halo rings, often serving the role of sub-monitor for a given facility. Caradon AIs are said to be quite similar to the facilitator class. Monitors are the stewards of vast Forerunner creations such as Halo rings or shield worlds. Their minds are housed within floating robotic carapaces that are typically spherical in shape. One particular monitor, 343 Guilty Spark, was unique in that he was created by essentially converting the mind of an ancient human into digital form. Medarchs are AIs with so much computational potential that they were able to lead the charge on immense construction projects, or command vast flotillas of warriors into battle. Each Medarch AI was a leader of an army of much smaller computational minds, a group referred to as a Medarchy. There's also sub-Medarchs, slightly lesser versions of the same class. During the waning days of the Forerunner Flood War, a new version of artificial life was created. Using a device called a composer, physical essences were converted into digital forms and given new shapes. These deadly new bodies were composed of hard light and were given the moniker of Prometheans. This means that each Promethean soldier houses the mind of what once was a forerunner, or in some cases, a human. The newly digitized minds of those who were composed became formidable fighters, their consciousness stored in combat chassis known as knights. These hulking constructs fight with unparalleled ferocity, making use of weaponry in their arm-mounted hard light blades. The sides of their backs are weak to ballistic weaponry, but they make up for this in their ability to dodge incoming projectiles with startling speed. Underneath their metallic face is what resembles a glowing human or forerunner skull. Some knights have been used to house the non-volitional AIs that joined Cortana during the created uprising. They come in quite a few variations, the primary three being Lancer, Battle Wagon, and Commander variants. Most, if not all, are outfitted with Promethean Vision, essentially an improved version of thermal optics that can allow them to see targets through solid surfaces. They're also generally equipped with auto turrets, small circular devices that fire hard light projectiles at their enemies. Many of the knights have fragmented memories of their previous state of being, but they're mostly inaccessible to them. Their orders come from an intelligence that's referred to as Strategos, an entity that was originally one of the Didact's most loyal warrior compatriots. It was his mind that would serve as a conductor of sorts and would occasionally inhabit specific Promethean units that were simply given the moniker of Knight Strategos. To outfit the knights with additional aid, Watcher Ancillas were created. These small aerial combat units are stored in the backs of knights and are armed with unique defensive capabilities. For example, if an attacker throws an explosive towards them or their knight, they are able to fling it back using what is referred to as a quote-unquote gravity displacement beam. Upon the destruction of a nearby knight, they are able to rebuild them and restore them to former glory, so long as they do so quickly. I hate them. Crawlers are another construct created to outfit the knight's combat capabilities. Typically traveling in packs, crawlers use their numbers and speed to overwhelm their adversaries. Their four-legged bodies grant them the ability to run very quickly and scale certain vertical surfaces like walls or trees. Though they resemble more simplistic creatures like dogs, they're still quite intelligent and are able to strategize beyond a normal biological predator of similar capabilities. Armagers are basic AI created for combat roles. These deadly bipedal machines were employed by the Forerunners in many different battles. Originally, the AIs contained within them were quite advanced, but the Flood's ability to infect digital mind through a process called the Logic Plague caused the Forerunners to scale back their levels of sentience. The three primary forms they can take are soldiers, snipers, and officers. It's also worth mentioning that 343 Guilty Spark eventually took control of an armager to once again grant himself a physical form. Of all the Forerunner AIs, none are stranger than the immense peacekeeping war machines known as Guardians. Their entire purpose was to safeguard the galaxy through lethal force. 
If someone defied the Forerunners, Guardians were dispatched to end their lives if necessary. The machinations of their operation is very mysterious, and though they are generally controlled by an Ancilla, they also function via a connection to the Domain. This deep information repository was used by the Forerunners often, and is likely the source of the Guardians' strange propensity to contort their appearance into unnerving shapes that the Forerunners who designed them had no input on. Precursors were also capable of creating AIs, but only one of which has ever been recorded. This frightening and seemingly all-powerful entity was known as Abaddon. Very little information about these strange beings exists, save for the fact that they were somehow even more capable than the most advanced Forerunner AIs. Interestingly, in a brief altercation with a few Forerunners, Abaddon conjured several Promethean-like beings to fight against them, though not much is known about how exactly this worked. Another interesting thing worth mentioning is that the appearance of Guardians seems to match the appearance of Abaddon, so there appears to be some kind of correlation there. What it is, I couldn't tell you. Perhaps Abaddon simply was another form of precursor. The Warden Eternal appears to be a Promethean, but isn't. This strange hulking construct wasn't created by the Forerunners. Instead, it was created by the Domain itself, using the essence of Forerunners. A specific specialization within their species called Heruspices devoted their lives to understanding the Domain. They revered the enigmatic device with an almost religious devotion. As such, when the Halo Rings were activated and it was severely damaged as a result, a new entity was created. Using the essences of millions of Heruspices, the Domain forged the Warden Eternal, a massive being with an incalculable number of bodies that would be more than capable of protecting its creator. In order to maintain the vast swath of impressive technology that the Forerunners created, many smaller autonomous devices would need to be present to perform basic maintenance and janitorial upkeep. These come in the form of sentinels, and though they may not technically be alive, they do appear to possess a limited level of intelligence. So I'm including them just in case. Aggressors are the most common variation, patrolling basically every Forerunner creation and defending it wherever necessary. Constructors are tiny variants that simply maintain structures. Council Sentinels act as security on Forerunner worlds. Enforcers are much larger variants with both defensive and offensive functionality. Eradicators are used by some sub-monitors to better outfit their combat capabilities. Gatherers collect specimens for Forerunner lifeworkers. Guardians are different from actual Guardians. Their purpose is largely unknown. Protectors are very similar to aggressors in that they are used as defensive tools. Regulators survey Forerunner installations. Stewards gather massive amounts of materials and specialize in terraforming. Assemblers are akin to constructors in that they maintain structures but are much larger in size. Retrievers are huge, ship-sized sentinels with outrageously powerful weapon systems and the ability to maintain key points of interest in Forerunner facilities. Onyx sentinels are very similar to aggressors present on the planet with the same name and are considered more dangerous than more basic aggressors. Though all variations are used in battles against the Flood, safeguards appear to be designed specifically to combat them. Super Sentinels are very much the same as Enforcers, except they are much larger, therefore granting them more destructive potential. Extractors seemingly were used for mining, but little is known otherwise. Excavators are used alongside assemblers to aid in the construction of superstructures like Halo Rings. Controllers basically serve the same purpose as Enforcers. Stewards are gigantic Sentinels designed for truly enormous tasks, and come equipped with large grapplers for lifting heavy objects. Eliminators are a variant of Aggressor that are tinged gold, and equipped with better combat capabilities when compared to the base model. There's also the towers surrounding Sandbox and Sand Trap. Are they technically sentinels? I have no idea. There were surely many other kinds of these robotic stewards while the Forerunner Empire was at its peak, but they have been forgotten following the years after their fall, some of which are pictured in Halo Legends, but it's also important to keep in mind that this entire sequence is an interpretation of Cortana's, so it's not 100% accurate. Each faction within the Halo universe employs many different variants of automated turrets. How intelligent they are is unclear, but it's likely that they possess no sentience whatsoever. I'll still go over the different varieties just in case. The UNS SC employs several models, the most notable being M5 Talos, M3063 deployable turrets, M8 Wolf Spiders, and M71 anti-aircraft guns. The Covenant uses Emp Seam Pattern Antlions, Kiwu Ump Pipa Pattern Citadel Turrets, Scar Wa Pattern Mantis, Upisa Wary Pattern Shrike, Cheru Pattern Sky Striker, and Shuku Pattern Sentry Turrets. The Banished make use of spike turrets and other unnamed designs. The Forerunners made use of handheld deployable auto turrets, Z510 focus turrets, Z8250 light artillery, Z8250 heavy artillery, Trove base turrets, Arc turrets, and Z8060 particle cannons. 
This section is dedicated to the weirdos and rejects of the Halo universe, the creatures that don't really have any affiliations and not much is known about them. One of the most bizarre species within the Halo universe is the Zalanin, otherwise known as the Endless. Almost nothing about their true nature has been described thanks to their concealment and imprisonment by the Forerunners. The reason they were so well hidden was due to their ability to survive the pulse of the Halo Array. Though they'd seemingly commit no crimes, keeping them secret and imprisoned was paramount, for the revelation of their existence would be truly catastrophic. If a Zalanin were to be infected by the Flood, they too would obtain the ability to withstand the power of the Halos, a reality almost too terrible to imagine. They appear to be highly advanced, and existed during the height of the Forerunner's Empire. The only example of their species we've ever seen is a creature simply given the title of the Harbinger. Since she's the only of her species that we've seen, I'll be referring to her appearance exclusively. Just bear in mind that the Zalanin as a whole may come in varying shapes and sizes. Endless individuals possess legs, but are seemingly incapable of walking. Instead, they're aided by mechanical thrusters to keep them suspended in the air. These squid-like creatures vaguely resemble the Desrim, perhaps suggesting a common ancestor. Maybe this is why the Sanchayum were so intent on keeping their existence a secret. Their hairless heads are large and bulbous, while their faces are composed of two wide-set black eyes and a pair of flipper-like appendages on their cheeks. They also seem to have a beak, rather than teeth, further adding to the idea that they evolved from some kind of advanced marine animal like the Desrim. Their strangest trait is their ability to allegedly interact with living time, which was a metaphysical concept postulated by the Forerunners. The idea is that the universe itself is a vast living entity that encompasses everything and everyone within it. This could potentially imply that these beings are somehow connected to the precursors, but what their relationship to them would be is unclear. Once again, there's not a whole lot of information about the Gaskira, or skimmers. These agile airborne creatures are quite small, but are intelligent enough to equip exceptionally deadly armaments such as shock rifles. On the surface, their appearance is quite similar to the Zalanin, the most notable similarities being that flight is their primary source of locomotion motion, and their legs seem entirely useless for ground-based movement, perhaps even being vestigial. Unfortunately, we never get to see them without their helmets, and any publicly released concept art is very inconsistent regarding their facial features, leaving us with nothing but speculation. Interestingly, they have six limbs, four legs and two arms, giving them a vaguely insect-like appearance. The next few unclassifiable creatures are intelligent enough to build spacecrafts or maintain a society, but very little is known about their origins. This subset of strange unknowns are simply referred to as meddlers, and though each species likely shares no real affiliation, the lack of concrete information means they are not quite suited for their own sections. First off, both the Forerunners and the Covenant encountered many different kinds of alien life during their times roaming the stars, many of which either went undocumented or the data describing them has been lost. One such lost species was one that lived within a quote, great dense cloud, as described by 343 Guilty Spark. Sadly, this race remained hidden from the Forerunners and the Flood. As a result, they weren't reintroduced after the Halo Rings exterminated all sentient life within the galaxy. A communication from their place of origin was intercepted by 343 Guilty Spark, but once the Halo Rings were activated, they were wiped from existence. 343 also made note that other creatures that were similar to the Covenant in some way had visited his ring, recorded things they observed, and left. Roughly 50,000 years after the Halos were activated, a strange alien craft crash-landed on 343 Guilty Spark's ring. The pilots of the strange vessel never attempted to exit or make any sort of contact. He did make note of the fact that their atmosphere was extremely similar to the rings and that their ship was producing an automated distress call. Due to some perceived protocol, Spark sadly never ventured inside. Instead, he constructed a sarcophagus around the ship and moved on. Within one of the numerous Forerunner worlds was a series of mid-air holding cells that were used to contain mysterious prisoners. One of these was destroyed and whatever was inside managed to escape. Tons of ship debris at a defensive superconstruct created by the Forerunners called Line Installation 9-12 is present. Much of it is human or covenant in origin, but some of the destroyed crafts were built by unknown hands. In the ancient past, when the Precursors were at war with the Forerunners, a race of aliens existed on a planet called Netherop but the details regarding their race have been lost to time. It's implied that the flood outbreak on Installation 05 was instigated by outside forces, but who or what that could be is unclear. During the early days of Sanghili expansion among the stars, one individual encountered an unknown spacefaring species that attacked and killed the entirety of his crew. The only piece of information we have about these aliens is that they didn't speak a language that the Sanghili recognized. Allegedly, a prisoner to the Sanghili from a far-off planet taught a meditation technique that would eventually embed itself in their culture. 
At one point, the Covenant encountered a species on a planet called Karava, and when this race refused to join them, they were completely and totally annihilated. Bizarrely, humanity encountered several unidentified starships a few days before the Flood arrived on Earth. They were broadcasting old civilian identification codes and were quickly engaged by human forces. Most of them fled, but one stayed to fight, successfully destroying the UNSC Totem Lake. Humanity also managed to discover a few different alien races that lived underground. No other information about them currently exists. The Domain isn't technically a living being, but it does behave as if it has a consciousness. Though the Forerunners used it often to retrieve information, it wasn't created by them. This strange wealth of knowledge was made by the Precursors, and some speculate that it is in of itself a Precursor AI. Much like the mysterious nature of any divine force, the Domain doesn't operate in ways that are clear or easy to understand. Oftentimes, a specific piece of information would be presented at a strange time, the meaning of which would only be revealed later. Is is it alive? Seemingly. It appears to have its own agency, which is why I feel like I should include it here. Perhaps the domain is a conduit to living time? A means of communicating with the universe? It's impossible to say for certain. The Halo universe is a very vast place, and as such, it houses a truly dizzying quantity of alien wildlife, much of which has been given very little elaboration. To better deal with this section, I'm breaking it up into three parts. The first part I'm labeling interesting wildlife. What makes a particular animal interesting, you might ask? Information, mostly. This section will be dedicated to the animals that have the most information, starting with everyone's favorite birdie, the moa. Moas are large, flightless avian creatures endemic to the planet Reach. Their mostly feather-covered bodies are quite similar to an ostrich or an emu in both size and structure. Each of their large, three-toed feet end in sharp claws and are attached to extremely muscular legs. Though it's never illustrated in game, I imagine these sizable muscles not only provide them with rapid locomotion, but also a formidable defense in the form of kicking and scratching. Atop their long necks is a large head, affixed to which is a bony headpiece and purplish crest. For the most part, they're completely docile, and as such, they make both good pets and a source of food. After the fall of Reach and the destruction of their native habitat, their numbers have declined exponentially. It's because of this that their meat has become something of a delicacy and a very hot commodity among wealthy human individuals. Their meat is packaged and sold in many different forms, most notably Moa burgers and Moa nuggets. There was also Moa-flavored Pringles at one point in the real world. They were actually delicious, and I... Not all wildlife that calls Reach its home is as pleasant as the Moa, however. In fact, Guta are anything but. Though they're generally not aggressive, their considerable bulk makes them a very dangerous animal. These massive creatures are capable of both bipedal and quadrupedal locomotion. Their leathery and scaly skin is devoid of hair, and their extremely long arms are connected to three claws, two of which appear to be designed to slash any would-be attacker. Jutting from the front of their huge heads are two long tusks, likely used as weapons when sparring with other individuals of their species, akin to earthly elephants. They also possess a large muscular tail, likely used to help them balance while walking upright. Males have been known to be very territorial during mating seasons, and females are notoriously hostile when it comes time to defend their young. It remains to be seen if any of their species survived the fall of Reach. Veravores, otherwise known as keelbugs, are one of several creatures genetically shaped by Forerunner lifeworkers. Originally, they were a highly intelligent species from a planet that had been consumed by the Flood, but were altered in order to increase both their survivability and their usefulness. Much like the Huragak, keelbugs help maintain Forerunner megastructures. One key function they serve is consuming corpses and biological debris so that the local ecosystems aren't ridden by an influx of disease. Scavengers, essentially behaving like earthly vultures or buzzards. In some instances, they can also be aggressive, acting as a line of defense in the event of an intrusion of a Forerunner installation. Though they can appear in millions of different minor permutations based on the purpose they're intended to serve, they appear to all maintain a similar physical structure. Basically, the appearance of a large beetle with eight glossy blue eyes and a large protruding horn originating from their back. Forerunner installations were far more than just weapons or defensive platforms. Many of them functioned as museums or wildlife preserves as well, which is why many strange animals call these vast megastructures their home. The Zavfara, or Volpard, are another example of this. Data recovered by Cortana during her time on Alpha Halo discovered Covenant records referring to the creatures with a sense of familiarity, suggesting they had encountered them elsewhere. The name Volpard comes from their appearance. At first glance, they appear to be a hybrid of a vulture, thanks to their bizarre three-pronged hooked beak, 
and a leopard due to their black speckled coloration. Not much is known about their origin, but their genetics show signs of alteration and bear some resemblances to other creatures found on Forerunner facilities. Rangmeho, colloquially referred to as quad wings for obvious reasons, are one of the earliest examples of Forerunner gene crafting. These large predatory birds come in many different genetic variations thanks to natural evolution and various modifications, but each variant shares the same biological building blocks. Leveraging their intelligence, these formidable creatures hunt and coordinate flocks, oftentimes soaring high into the air, likely as a means of finding food. Thanks to the fact that they have four separate wings, they're able to stay in the air for long periods of time, seemingly never landing, much like frigate birds or albatrosses on Earth. Much like the Earth-based creatures I just mentioned, the Rangmeho prefer to nest in cliff sides overlooking large bodies of water. Their big muscular bodies come adorned with a long tail, a sizable beak, and an oftentimes colorful head crest. Ulf Mary, otherwise known as a sky leviathan, which is totally badass by the way, are large whale-like creatures that float above the surfaces of certain halo installations. These massive creatures don't just look like large Earth cetaceans, but their behavior is quite similar as well. They're extremely docile, and despite the size of what one would expect to be their cumbersome bodies, they clearly have excellent control over their physicality. Sky Leviathans have a basic language as well that's conveyed through moans and squeaks, once again very much so akin to the whales of Earth. Though it is a form of communication, these sounds can't be translated into words. Instead, they seem to indicate emotions or sensations. How they're able to stay aloft and float through the skies of the Ark is still unclear, but nonetheless, they can move through the air as gracefully as a humpback can move through water. Both merry individuals have interesting coloration. The undersides of their belly are a pale white, while their upper half is a soft covenant purple. Interestingly, the elf Mary possess four rear limbs and the presence of wings that seem to play no part in keeping them airborne. Moralaths, or blind wolves, are strong two-legged predators that utilize pack hunting strategies and bear a striking resemblance to many dinosaurs from Earth's ancient past. These ferocious creatures don't have arms, but they make up for this with their large muscular legs that are capable of carrying them at impressive speeds. A blind wolf individual's body is covered in scales and protruding from their backside is a thick tail that likely helps them balance atop their two legs. As their name suggests, they have no eyes and are therefore blind, but a keen sense of smell offsets this peculiarity. Their powerful jaws are capable of easily tearing a human being asunder, and their two massive fangs only aid in this ability. When frustrated, blind wolves tend to snap their jaws shut randomly, perhaps in an attempt to decompress from the natural endorphins that undoubtedly flow through their bodies during a hunt. Much like many of the other creatures that are present on Forerunner facilities, blind wolves were genetically modified by the Forerunners to grant them the ability to hunt in many different environments. Chafka, or tusk beasts, are extremely dangerous quadrupedal animals that, remarkably, the Forerunners found on thousands of different worlds. How they managed to expand across the stars is unclear, but given their animalistic attitudes, it's not likely they did so aboard a spacecraft. This strange discovery prompted the Forerunners to study the creatures quite a bit, but nothing unusual or of note was ever discovered. Terrifyingly, these predatory animals release a pheromone into the air while hunting that causes psychotropic effects to their prey, therefore inhibiting their ability to escape. Each tusk beast's hairy white body has two large horns jutting from its back, two from the top of its head, and finally an additional two on each side of their tooth-ridden maws. Though they're omnivorous, being around them is far from safe, as they won't hesitate to make a meal out of anyone that gets too close. Thanks to their pale coat, Chafka will often hide in the snow, effectively camouflaging themselves to appear like a snowy boulder. Maybe you've noticed that there's a weird droning sound in the background of a lot of this audio. Well, those were cicadas in the trees outside, and they would not shut up, and I refused to re-record this entire section because of it, so too bad. Bestiary. Bugs. Brontotheres, Chemistro, or Rhinox, are extremely similar to earthly rhinoceros in appearance. Their stocky bodies are covered in gray leathery skin, they are quadrupedal, and of course, they each have one large bony structure on the front of their heads. These pseudo-horns are a bit different than a rhinoceros's in that they curve upward and have a slight split in the middle, making them look more like antlers rather than actual horns. Their snouts, shoulders, and backs are covered in osteoderms, which are bony deposits that form scales or plates on an animal's skin. Rhinoc gut biomes are fascinating thanks to the fact that they work alongside Forerunner nanomachines as a sort of biological reactor to create useful chemicals. These large animals are migratory, and as such can be seen traveling great lengths across the surface of whatever installation they call home. Tuliok are found deep in the bowels of Installation 07. These odd creatures are roughly the size of a goat and gather in large flocks. 
When collected together, they produce a low humming sound and their bodies seem to be able to create an electromagnetic frequency that can interfere with communication systems. Their membranous wings are thin and each are punctuated with bioluminescent veins. Their claws are very sharp and rather strangely centered on the palms of their paws is a suction cup that's used for sticking to surfaces. Their bodies are covered in short black fur and their heads sport fox-like faces with round black eyes. Even stranger, each individual has two tails. Tuliac lay their eggs in vines that eventually hatch into a larval form. In this phase of their life, they feed on a forerunner crystal until they're ready to cocoon and transform into a full-fledged adult. This strange crystal housed a vast swath of collected consciousness and memories from humans or forerunners that died in the past. Billions of bits of information, essences of lives past, and fragmented memories were stored within, and when the Tuliac feed on the device, some of that information is absorbed as well, effectively meaning that those who died are able to live on within the strange creatures. The Iyamatua, or anglers, are the creatures seen in the glass tubes on the Halo 4 multiplayer map, Abandon. These beasts are predatory in nature, and as a result, they are sometimes used as a biological countermeasure by forerunners to keep meddlers out of certain facilities. They were initially discovered on a planet called Erebus 7, and after the firing of the array, they were reseeded there as well. Anglers display a frightening level of intelligence and are capable of adjusting hunting strategies in the heat of combat, as well as perfectly mimicking sounds to lure their prey, including human voices. Their name comes from the strange light they emit to attract other animals, a hunting strategy used by deep sea anglerfish on Earth. They're also remarkably protective of their young and have been known to butcher anyone foolish enough to capture their offspring. These creatures are formidable and have very few weaknesses, aside from an apparent aversion to certain ultrasonic frequencies. Once they are in close range of their prey, they spit a sleep-inducing neurotoxin, and once the food source is unconscious, they will oftentimes shove them into things like hollowed-out trees to retrieve later. Despite their animalistic four-legged appearance, they're exceptionally intelligent and are even able to recognize when to remove gear from humans that could be used to fight back against them. Salabons, or thorn beasts, are massive, remarkably resilient creatures. Thanks to this, they were reseeded on many different worlds after the activation of the Halo Array, and similarly bred on different planets under Covenant occupation. One of the planets Forerunners populated with the creatures was the Brute's homeworld, Doisak. To the Jaralhanai, thorn beasts are exceptionally important animals because every facet of their being is useful in some way. They are consumed quite frequently as well, aside from the neck regions, which contain dangerous neurotoxins. Though they are technically four-legged, they seem to prefer walking bipedally, which makes sense given the fact that their back legs are extremely muscular and their front appendages behave more like arms. Their name derives from the five bony thorn-like protrusions jutting out of their backs, which are likely used defensively in the face of a predator. Despite their immense size, they are seemingly not very dangerous, mostly due to their docile disposition. Cathal, or their far more badass moniker, Nightmare Eel, are huge fish-like creatures that spend their lives underwater on a planet called Beta Gabriel. Their long yellowy green bodies are mostly composed of a huge tail, an appendage that surely enables rapid movement through the waters of their home, especially while they're hunting the large crustaceans they consume as a primary food source. Particularly brave forerunner researchers engaged in hunts for the creatures, in which, when performed successfully, an unusual but useful substance was extracted from the glands of the beast. Though this seemed to be harmless for the Cathal, it was an exceptionally treacherous task for the forerunners brave enough to attempt it. Their faces are adorned with six bulbous eyes and a mouthful of large protruding treating beak-like teeth, no doubt designed for crushing the exoskeletons of their prey. Feru are a four-legged dog-like species that was often kept as pets by ancient humans in Sanchayum. Their diets consist of plants, and their docile nature means they make excellent companions. Much like how some cultures eat dogs on modern-day Earth, some humans use the feru as a food source. Unfortunately, these strange animals were also the vectors of the very first flood outbreak. By feeding the creatures a strange, inert powder that was discovered on a few abandoned ships, their genetics were altered over the course of several generations. Initially, the effects this powder had on them was strictly positive, but a few hundred years after its introduction into their diets, feru individuals started being born with clumps of soft fur between their shoulders. Much like the other seemingly positive effects the powder produced, this trait was actively sought after, but unbeknownst to their human and Sanchayum owners, it was the first in a series of increasingly terrible deformities. For some unknown reason, these hairy clumps were often ravenously consumed by other feru, seemingly only spreading the affliction further. Disgusting rods and other fleshy growths began sprouting from the skin of the animals, and eventually this fledgling disease would make the leap to the humans that used the animals as a food source. It was here that the flood first began to take shape. Palacer are large water-dwelling cetacean that live in the oceans alongside the Cathal. 
They have no eyes, but make use of remarkable echolocation to navigate and hunt for large colonies of krill-like organisms. They breathe air, and as such, occasionally must surface to inhale through the thousands of pores covering their large bodies. A large dorsal fin stretches completely across their backs, even sitting above their tails slightly. Much like sky leviathans, they produce songs that sound very similar to earthly whales. The seclusion creatures are a very strange avian species. Little is known of them, outside of the fact that they possessed massive translucent wings and were at least twice the size of large forerunner warrior servants. At the center of their bodies is a series of bioluminescent nodes, two of which are blue, while the other is red. They are able to survive in extremely hostile environments, specifically the gaseous world of seclusion. Their hardiness prompted the forerunners to keep their presence a secret for fear that the flood would exploit their innate survivability to their advantage. Much like Moa and Guta, Spadehorn are also native to Reach. Named after their two large antlers, these stocky herbivores are domesticated by human settlers living on the planet. Their woolly bodies seem to suggest that they lived in cold climates, but thanks to the destruction of Reach, their populations have likely dropped precipitously, assuming they're not outright extinct. This is a logrodite. These crustacean-looking creatures were favored by the forerunners thanks to their ability to consume bacteria that's harmful to most other species. They are highly resilient extremophiles, akin to tardigrades, and are able to live in even the most hostile environments. The creatures hail from a series of asteroids located on the outskirts of forerunner-controlled space. Helioskrill are dragon-like ambush predators that are very intelligent. Their backs are covered in a series of long spikes that could perhaps be feathers, and their jaws are quite similar to the Sanghili, their mouths consisting of mandibles that separate into four parts. Each of their four legs ends in a set of three claws, and the presence of a tail is also obvious, though what its purpose could be, I'm unsure. Orzil are decent-sized beetles that call the coastal mountains of Sanghelios their home. They are only one of many different kinds of similar species that hail from the area. Skeln are a species of airborne predators native to Sanghelios that are best known for their speed and appetite. Their large leathery bodies are tinged blue, and at the ends of each of their wings are bioluminescent spots. Much like the Helios Grill and the Sanghili themselves, their mouths separate into four mandibles, which is apparently a common adaptation on Sanghelios. Colo are shiny-coated cattle that the Sanghili raise for food. They're basically their version of a cow. Their large striped bodies are just plain bizarre, and I can't even speculate as to why their back is shaped like that. Crincadon are yet another Sanghelios native. These flying creatures aren't birds, but they're similar and take residence in the cliff faces of a portion of the Sanghili homeworld called Kivro. Their diet consists mostly of carrion, but they have been known to hunt giant fist-sized dust mites as well. Luminon are classified as quote-unquote sky rays and are capable of flight. They were also regarded quite fondly by the Forerunner builders, which is why they can be found on creations they favored. Their diet consists of sea creatures that they're able to scoop up on the surface of the water. Whether they do this in flight or stop to land is unclear. The ogre wolf species originated on one of Doisak's moons, Tish. They're very hyena-like, I guess. We don't have any concrete visual of them aside from concept art, which is pretty inconsistent. This is likely a scrub grub, a type of pest that can be found feeding on the machinery within Covenant ships. Their bodies are covered in many fine hairs that move about to sense for danger. I can't be certain these are actually scrub grubs. They're seemingly not hairy, so who knows. If not, we can just refer to them as cute little bug guys instead. Tatir are dangerous aquatic animals that call the warm waters of Sanghelios their home. Their inherent aggression can make traveling across the areas they live quite dangerous. This image might not be a tatir, but it's the only underwater creature from Sanghelios that's ever been pictured, so I'm assuming that's what it is. This video better get views because I have spent so much time cutting out all of these PNGs. Dear God. Earth is a pivotal location in this universe, and as such, many of the real-life animals we see on our planet are also present in Halo. Now, I'm obviously not going to sit here and list every single species ever discovered on planet Earth. Instead, I'm going to briefly list all of the animals that have been confirmed to exist and have been directly mentioned in some way. Okay, ready, set, go. Bat, barnacle, blue whale, bonobo chimpanzee, domestic cat, camel, chicken, cobra, cattle, cricket, crocodile, clam, domestic dog, eagle, elephant, elk, firefly, fox, fruit fly, goat, goose, honey badger, honeybee, horse, Impala, morning warbler, moose, mule, opossum, owl, panda, pigeon, rabbit, rat, rhinoceros, river dolphin, shrike, snail, squid, squirrel, starling, tiger, trout, tuna, turkey, shark, varroa mite, white-tailed deer, white sturgeon, wolf, wildebeest, and zebra. Earth isn't the only planet to have an extensive list of creatures like this. There's also the human-occupied world called Geo. There are no real visuals for these creatures, so I'm going to gloss over them kind of quickly. 
chirping spiders are troglobitic arachnoids that are blind and have an albino complexion. Frilled salamanders are amphibious creatures that live in the planet's vast cave systems. Ghost scorpions are very similar to chirping spiders, but obviously more closely resemble scorpions instead of spiders. Glowfish are fish that glow. Hyaline crayfish are likely named after their translucent exterior. Idjums are a type of bird. Jungaloons are jellyfish-like creatures that feed on insects and possess a gas bladder which enables them to float through the air. No shell snails have no shell, so a slug, I guess. Ribbon snakes are not the same as the ones on Earth. Or maybe they are, and were introduced by human settlers. I have no idea. Sarios are large, flat reptiles that dwell in the caves of Gao. Sherms are flightless birds. Speckled jungle dragons are large lizards with huge head frills that display when they feel threatened. Walking snails are massive snails that can grow to be as large as a human's arm. The following creatures are directly tied to Sanghelios and those that call that planet their home, the elites. Archonta are a kind of meat-eating fish that live on Sanghelios. They're incredibly fast and possess a level of fearlessness that's respected by the Sanghelios. Chiguts are an unknown species that the elites are familiar with. Caracata blood lizards are native to a sanghili controlled world and roughly resemble the felent pattern revenant. Doarmir are hair-covered animals whose pelts were deemed useful. Dunak are animals endemic to another elite colony. These creatures possess two tusks and horns that spiral backwards. Their bodies are covered mostly by hair, including their multiple trunks. Electric cash are a kind of scaly sea fish found on Sanghelios that likely produce some kind of electrical current. Fleg are a small insect-like creature known by the Sanghili, but no other information outside of that exists. Gardel are often referred to as mad. Gat appear to be some kind of common farmer's pest. Little is known about the Gortoa, aside from the fact that they are often slaughtered by the elites. Hopping slugs are presumably slugs that hop. I don't know. They are prey to the Sankili Slitherers, though. I have no idea what they're like either. All we know is that being compared to an Islar is very insulting. Jellasuge are a particularly difficult to eradicate creature that is initially easy to kill, but somehow its offspring will manage to return and be more violent than its parent. Kero etba are insect-like creatures that roughly bear the appearance of a ghost. Usalb are giant steer-like animals native to the Sankili moon, Kikost. Dundrab are massive colorful amphibians that are venomous. Kifra are medium-sized four-legged animals, a variety of which is said to resemble an animal native to Africa. Once again, the only thing we know about the Kiniji is that it's insulting to be referred to as one. Kaskatu are a farm animal used as a food source by the Sangheili. Megafet are pack-hunting animals that were known for taking down large prey and destroying farms. Muleg are akin to lice, parasitically making a home out of one's head. Nishum are a kind of intestinal parasite that live within a Sangheili. Okadath are much like jellyfish and are roughly the size of a Huragak. The Querith slugs are from Suban and look similar to Earth's sea slugs. Quillic are little predatory animals that the Sangheili had as pets. Little is known about the ref Crete. The only information passed down through generations was distorted into myth. Scorkin are swamp dwelling creatures that are once again used as an insult. Snaptail are a type of fish that is considered a prized catch. Thramalion lizards are best known for running. Apparently. Velithra are domesticated animals used for their ability to be a pack mule. Vespin are arachnoid creatures that live within the vast temples of St. Helios. Zotokel crabs are crabs, obviously, that vaguely resemble certain shade turret designs. There's also those weird animals pictured in the last voyage of the Infinite Sakor comic. Both Nuctal and Pilgot are once again completely unknown, but used as an insult by the Sangheili. Tiap are fast. Teraki Kolo. Next up are animals associated with brutes. Very little information about the Degeorth exists, aside from the fact that they were large predatory animals that were native to Doisak. Dengkra are strange canine reptile hybrid type creatures that were often hunted by brutes on Doisak. Grattleba shrews are likely rodents of some kind that lived on the brutes' homeworld and were known for being excellent protectors of their offspring. Kalkum are flying animals that are able to withstand a strike from another creature in the air and maintain their flight path regardless. Katu Kal were often utilized as companions for the Jarlhanai and once fully matured would become fearsome war beasts. The Nymph must really suck because all we know about them is that they've been used as an insult. Next on the list is animals associated with those greasy long necked f the Sanchayum. Ilifula are aquatic animals that had shells and lived in the oceans of the Sanchayum's homeworld, Janjar Kwam. The Falasteed are extremely badass, sentient plants that would morph themselves into a horse like shape for their Sanchayum riders. These bizarre botanical entities weren't a natural phenomenon, instead, they were thought to be created through Sanchayum gene forging. Garfren are cattle-like creatures that were domesticated by the residents of Janjar Kwam. They were raised mostly for meat, milk, and cheese. Ilpdor are very large carnivorous amphibians with scaled bodies and webbed feet that end in sharp claws. Nilash live in the water, have long necks, and are apparently weightless. Rexcraja are flying creatures with light skin and bony wings. Chungus Bungus are fat creatures with buttholes for eyes and fingers for teeth. Kidding, I'm just making sure you're still listening. And you better be, because there will be a test. These animals were preserved by the Forerunners. 
Glebos are small furry animals. Yes, that's it. Kraladonk are swarming creatures that have extremely sharp mouths and are capable of burrowing their small heads through just about any opening. Mammoths and some kind of millipede were found in the Ark, so that's cool. Merce are described as fleshy lily pads, which is the worst thing I've read all week. Tarantivir are immense creatures that were roughly 50 times larger than a Forerunner. There have been a few instances of random deer-like animals popping up on Forerunner installations as well, most notably present on the Ark. One Forerunner world housed a plethora of creatures. The most notable were giant flying animals that vaguely resembled the type of bird on Earth called a shrike. Their hunting patterns are similar, both of which will skewer their prey onto sharp points, but these animals were utterly massive. I don't even know if I should include this, but Asteroidea merozoit was a virulent disease created by a crazy forerunner AI. Yes, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Halo Cryptum makes mention of tritorsoed aquatic creatures, which is disgusting. Zeta Halo has scorpions and mosquitoes. Thank goodness the forerunners saved them. One of the shield worlds has lizards with narrow bird-like faces and frilled crests. There are also beetle-like insects, about 10 inches long with bright orange stripes and a long tapered spiked tail. The Sidaro forerunners populated their home with a bunch of animals based on their genetics. These animals have no theme. Suffredon are large manta ray-like creatures endemic to the planet Sundown. They share an ecosystem and have been seen peacefully interacting with Navorka, which is a species of aquatic mammal best known for their playful demeanor. Drymanders are a mostly unknown species that called Arcadia their home. Ghost squirrels or Dwarka squirrels greatly resemble their earthly counterparts. Flutterbugs are an unknown species of what is presumably an insect, offhandedly mentioned by John 117, so they're important, okay? Swamp rats are an unknown species of rat mentioned by an unknown marine. Crikey, giant crocodiles are native to the human colony of Tessera. Great red sharks are undoubtedly a type of elasma branch native to New Carthage. Ice sharks are sharks found on Draco 3. Moon crabs are a shimmery type of crustacean native to Myers Moon. Apocrity are creatures of the night that build nests on the world. Luyatin. Luyatin? I don't know. A blood mott might be an animal or a plant. I have no idea. What I do know is that a species of winged lizard called night gear feed on them. Apparently the precursors populated many worlds with some kind of quote unquote sea scorpion, which sounds pretty ominous to be honest. This cut creature from reach might be a woolly pygmy goat and this one might be a gray squirrel. If they are, humans eat them. Naori or octo whales are large water dwelling creatures found on Draco 3. Their size was immense, supposedly becoming as large as an island. Parasitic leeches that roughly resemble Earth's bats feed on the Naori, likely siphoning off their blood as a food source. Sardan's cats are a species of feline native to Meridian and are said to have a pair of glowing eyes, elongated bodies, and potentially prehensile tails. Scale lizards are reptiles that live on Cairo and have the propensity to chew up anything they find. Mud wasps are often eaten by ungoy and are native to Balaho. Shade crabs are also native to Balaho. We know absolutely nothing about the buff out, aside from the fact that they're eaten by humans. Same goes for the hammer horn. Chirats are small insect-like creatures that flew around on their homeworld of Reach prior to its glassing. Goopers were some kind of Reach wildlife, but not much is known about them. Again, thanks to the whole planetary annihilation thing. Reach is said to have carrion-eating birds, Kropi were creatures that were said to slither about. Octopoda can be found on Balaho and look like an octopus that lives on dry land. Zap jelly are another Balaho native that are residents of its oceans. Thumb birds are from Luyatin, the planet that I don't know how to pronounce and are best known for bringing plagues to humans. I guess you could count the flash clones that the UNSC created to replace the Spartan children they abducted as a different subspecies. They're the same as regular humans, they just deteriorate really fast. And for some reason, I'm including them in the wildlife section. That is really messed up. Wow, that's fine. We're going with it. Remember how I mentioned that Cathal eat some kind of crustacean? Well, they're three meters or nine feet long. So yeah, can't forget about the krill type creatures that the Palosaur feed on, but we know even less about them. There's also the fist sized dust mites I mentioned earlier that the Krinkadon eat, which sounds kind of terrifying. Here's a picture of a random lizard from a planet called Ven3, an unknown dead animal originating from a world called Minab, a random eyeball of a creature that's about to get dissolved by a halo ring, a low-res squiggle of a bird from the Rise of Atriox comic. There's also the not-infected versions of the Thrasher, Swarm, and Bomber flood forms, but what those looked like prior to conversion is anyone's guess. If it weren't for Lucille on Reddit here, I'd have absolutely zero information about these next few animals, so big shout to them. Thanks, dude. Pethos appear to be some kind of snake, maybe? It's hard to say. 
Sludes are meek creatures looked down on by the Sangheili. I have no idea what a Terret or a Gat is, but apparently Gats are prey to Terrets. Tefts are tiny flying arachnids that seemingly feed on the blood of others, much like earthly mosquitoes. This final section is what I'm referring to as the make it stop, this is driving me crazy, there are too many weird little offhand animals that have nothing to do with anything but are pictured once or maybe used as ambient scent dressing, please help. Okay, here we go. We've got... Harvest bird, reach koi. High charity fish, Sanghelios beetle. Trove bird, regret fish. High charity slash earth slash tempest slash arc gull. African yellow bird. Winter contingency eagle. Winter contingency red bird. Halo infinite chicken thing. Striped gopher. Silent cartographer sea worm. Sierra 117 fish. High ground slash Valhalla fish. Tempest fish, remnant slash reach crow. Valhalla yellow butterfly. Valhalla blue butterfly. Halo 2 anniversary slash Halo 4 paper bird. Halo 5 paper bird. Maybe Illumina. Poorly animated Halo 4 bird. Remnant barnacles. Requiem barnacles. CE bug. Backwash firefly. 343 guilty spark firefly. Halo infinite blue firefly. Halo infinite orange firefly. Halo infinite green firefly. Abandoned firefly. Reach firefly. Requiem firefly. 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 Fly. Firefly. 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 CR117 bug. They're also an ODST. Yellow Halo 5 bug. Sandworm. Blue Halo 5 mushroom bug. Halo 5 fish. These weird guys on Colosseum. Halo infinite paper bird. Halo infinite red flying bird, infinite bug 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Some of these might be the same, I don't know, I'm not good with color. Halo Wars 2 fish, infinite paper fish, infinite distant fish, random giant bird eggs, infinite orange butterfly, infinite blue butterfly. Allegedly Halo Wars 2 has butterflies, but I couldn't find them, so here's a picture of Reaper Marami looking at them wistfully. Infinite fish, long-legged flying infinite bird, bioluminescent infinite bird, ridgeline butterfly, Halo 5 bug 1, Halo 5 bug 2, Halo 5 bug 3, Halo 5 bug 4, which looks suspiciously like Halo 4 bug. Halo 5 bug 5. Halo 5 bug 6, which might just be Halo 5 bug 1. I promise there's a bug here. Disgusting penance jigglers. And last but certainly not least, these weird little jellyfish guys in Halo 4. I love them. To anybody at 343 or Microsoft that might be watching this, I'm available if you want to consult me on future animal names. I got you. Just remember, I'm the one that named these penance jigglers. It doesn't get much more clever than that. I almost considered the names of UNSC vehicles as confirmation of an animal's existence, but then I remembered that gremlins are definitely not real animals and opted to exclude the idea as a result. I'm not including any animals that are presented through artistic representation. A photo is acceptable, but we draw things like dragons in the real world all the time, and those probably aren't real. So for example, the discarded hippo toy on Foundry is not evidence to suggest hippos actually exist in Halo. Make sense? Okay, moving on. I'm not including sound effects either. Since they oftentimes have no source, they could be originating from a freaking Forerunner radio in a bush for all we know. Before anyone mentions it, I don't think Easter eggs like the Monkey Men in Halo 3 or the Gargoyle in Halo 2 are canon, so I don't want to hear it in the comments. There's also a list of animals that probably are canon, but since they were all ultimately cut from their respective games and have yet to be introduced in any other capacity, I'll just do a quick slideshow for you. Rockworm, eye bug, thorax, arctic icehound, space owl, harvest whale, oxyana, reach porcupine, reach slug, reach fish, harvest eel thing, Antaeus, stalker, three leg, tank beast, space jellyfish, cockatoo, guaira, hornbill, blue throated bird, thanks to General Heed for discovering these four birds, requiem flying squid, requiem jellyfish, thanks to Zedkins from the dig site team for unearthing this guy, this, that, these, the final thing I want to mention is fractures. Halo has just barely dipped its toes into multiversal what-if stories, and though they're usually completely and totally separate from the primary universe, I do want to go over some of the unique creatures that call them home, albeit briefly. Briefly because there's very little information about them, not because I don't like them. The Entrenched Universe houses a version of the Covenant that are irradiated monsters. As per usual, there appears to be Spartans in this particular dimension too, but what differences there are from the twos or threes we know and love is unclear. The Flood seems to have existed in some capacity as well, simply called the Old Ones. Some humans had become Covenant cultists and had taken to altering themselves through radiation, effectively becoming something else. This version of the Covenant contained jackals, which possessed bulbous eyes and sickly pale skin. Prophets existed in some capacity too, but in Instead of being feeble old men, they were enormous and muscular. Their bodies had been fused together, three beings forming a horrific amalgamation of flesh and bone. It's worth mentioning that we don't know if all of their species looked like this. Grunts also exist in this universe. The Covenant employed some kind of nanotechnological swarms that somehow alter human physiology. The effects were different per individual. Some melted from within, while others lost their minds and fired upon their comrades. Within the Bioroid universe, the Forerunners created a parasitic creature that infects individuals with something called the quote-unquote Reclaimer Spark. 
Through an unknown process, this converts them into deadly warriors that are forced to kill the quote unquote thinking death. Clearly this universe's version of the flood. The Belos universe contains its own version of the Spartan program. Augmented individuals are referred to as demigods, but it's unclear if this process is any different from what happened in the primary universe. The Black Guard universe has its own kind of Spartans as well, but what little information we have makes no mention of an augmentation procedure, just special armor and weaponry. Black Guard has their own version of the Covenant, simply referred to as Covenant Hordes. The Drenger universe is pretty much the same situation as Belos. They fight a version of the Flood as well that they call Shapeless Horrors. There's also mentions of ancient gods and monsters, which is the most vague thing ever, and great beasts who browse among the limbs of the world tree. Also dragons and worms, with a Y. The Tenrai universe also has augmented humans and a version of the Covenant, but if any differences exist, we don't know what they are. The Megaframe universe is really weird. Within it exists an entity called Halzon and an adversarial group called the Auspex Empire. Spartans in this universe are referred to as Sierra Troopers and obtain some kind of power from magical rings called Dynam Rings. There's also a mention of a Brutal Core in something called the Acker Sun Clan. Very clever. And a Trunk Beast? Whatever that means. The Panzerdoll universe appears to be exactly the same as the main one, except individuals within the UNSC and the Covenant fight each other in mech suits. I guess if you wanted to call the universe the odd one out short takes place in a fracture, you could. It houses a genetically enhanced brute named Pluton, weirdly powerful humans seemingly made by an AI, Gigantosaurus, and Pterodactyl. And of course, Spartans, AIs, and the Covenant. Oh, and regular humans too. Duh. Whew, okay, I'm done. And frankly, it's quite possible I missed some ambient creatures or something. If there's anything that you know of, let me know down below so I can update a pinned comment with anything I missed. I tried my best to denote all of my sources in the description, but with the sheer amount of information presented and the absurd number of places I found it, odds are I forgot some, so make of that what you will. Regardless, huge thanks to the folks at Halopedia for making a lot of this information very easily accessible and leaving the perfect amount of breadcrumbs to guide me towards even more information. Even bigger thanks to all of the people that have written for Halo over the years as well. If it weren't for those talented folks, we wouldn't have these fun details to obsess over. I'd also like to thank my father for allowing me to bounce lots of annoying stuff off of him. He absolutely does not need a shout out from me considering he has almost 2 million subscribers, but here it is anyways. I want to thank my wife for putting up with me and listening to me jabber on about bugs and other ridiculous things in Halo. She also helped me film the in-person bits, so that's cool. My sister helped do that as well, so thanks to her too. I also want to thank my best PG Dom for helping me find some of the most minuscule creatures in various multiplayer maps. Lastly, I want to extend a hearty thanks to you for sticking around until this point in the video. I hope you liked it. It was a tremendous undertaking, but I enjoyed putting this together, even if I do feel like an absolute lunatic surrounded by books and pouring over minuscule details about dumb shit. If you'd like to see me make a bestiary about another universe similar to this one, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I bid you adieu. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go play some Halo.